we're very fortunate to have Dan Clements, who's a uh, class of 1968, and we're going to have a conversation about his time at Penn State and, and moving forward from there. Great to see you, Dan. Great to Thank have you. you with us. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us generally about your background, your, your time, your hometown, uh, what life was like before you went to Penn State. Okay. I was born in Manhattan and lived in Queens and then moved out to a town called East Meadow and Long Island, which is in the middle of Nassau County. Mm -hmm. Went to high school there. Our high school football coach and social studies teacher was a gentleman named George Paterno. And that's how I came to go to Penn State. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me to go see him to talk about colleges and went to see him one afternoon and he said, I love Penn State and put out a little booklet uh, with all these pictures of Happy Valley. And at the end of which uh, I said, great. And he handed me an application and he said, fill it out. And I said, I can't. My handwriting is atrocious. Mm -hmm. They'll never accept me. So he actually filled out my wow. application for me. Uh, told me to look up his brother, Joe, who was the assistant head coach. Hmm. I am so old, as I say. Joe mm -hmm. Paterno was not the head coach when I started here. It was with Bengals. And um, so then came up to Happy Valley, came up to Penn State, and had mm -hmm. never seen the campus. We didn't do any college tours in mm -hmm. those days, and most of my fellow students also did not do college tours. Um, so we came up to Penn State and, and uh, got involved immediately with the student government. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very white campus. Uh, there was still a quota in those days of 2.7 men for every woman, uh, for every woman, so that you had to many times uh, some of the guys would go off to other campuses to find women to go out with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even up to um, uh, even up to Erie, I think, as far up as Erie. Mm -hmm. And uh, came here, was involved in the student government with the College of Liberal Arts and ran for freshman class president and lost, mm -hmm. um, and then stayed involved. I was a political science major, um, uh, did that for the four years, was not a great student. I chuckle whenever I get introduced as a distinguished alumni <laughs> that I am not distinguished by my 2.68 average. I am distinguished by the fact that I send money and continue to send money because of my love for the university, actually, um, and for what they do. The university at that time, of course, is not the university of today. Uh, there were only two schools that were top ranked in the country. That was agriculture and, hospi agriculture and hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, the university has changed, of course, dramatically in the last 20 years, becoming a top-notch school. Mm -hmm. um, I guess starting in 86, they made an enormous effort to do that. Now again, you may not know that was Joe Paterno, who stood up after the national title in 70, in 86 and said, we have a first class football team, we have a top rated, and we're not a top rated university, and what we have to do to correct that is to raise money and to start bringing the kind of professors that we can attract if we turn into a first class academic institution. So schools started raising money and mm -hmm. kind of changed over time. My personal background, after college, I went to George Washington Law School in Washington, D.C., and uh, did better there. Finally decided that uh, I was going to study and not just major in student activity. Um, and graduated, was a law clerk to a federal judge, then worked at the Justice Department Antitrust Division for a year and a half until I became an assistant U.S. attorney for Maryland um, from 1974 to 79. Uh, while I was there, I became chief of uh, the civil division as well as chief of special prosecutions. It was a small office and we didn't have uh, that many people. So I at one point carried two hats in doing both special prosecutions as well as um, civil work, mostly malpractice defense for the hospitals, VA hospitals and, and uh, Bowling Air Force Base hospitals, etc. And Walter Reed. Um, so we then, uh, I did that till 79, joined a big firm in D.C. for a couple of years, and in 82 joined some friends uh, in Baltimore, went back to Baltimore um, to do largely plaintiff's work over the course of uh, the next 32 years until I retired in 2014. I did uh, more than half my practice was medical malpractice, products liability, um, and uh, auto tort cases. I did criminal law, criminal defense law, 
both in Washington, D.C. after I was an assistant and then all the way through about 1993 and then stopped doing it largely because of the sentencing guidelines um, that existed at the federal level, which have since been ruled unconstitutional. You couldn't do much for your clients. Your clients got prosecuted in the sentence according to the guidelines, and so I just was bothered by it and didn't find it as much fun or interest and didn't feel you could make as much of a difference for your clients. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we go back to the student government. Um, yeah. what, what, what attracted you to do, doing student government, and what, what, what were the issues uh, that, that energized you the most? Well, the interest actually, I guess, was just long standing. In high school, I was involved in the student government. And in fact, in my high school, proposed that we establish a student court system for student discipline, which they did um, establish uh, while I was there when I was a junior or mm. senior. And um, I had decided, weirdly, I had decided when I was 12 to be a lawyer. I had read a few books. There aren't many people who decided age 12 what their That's career, <laughs> career is going to be, but I decided at 12 I was a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. And so I read about law and uh, courtrooms and read courtroom fiction and courtroom nonfiction. Um, and so that was kind of my goal. And poli sci seemed like area to go to. In terms of being involved in student government, I had done it in high school and it just seemed natural to do it here at Penn State. Um, so I got involved with the Liberal Arts Student Co uh, was it the Liberal Arts Student Council mm -hmm. and then ran for freshman class president as I said. Um, the issues, my losing slogan was my student number and then uh, Dan Clements, he will make the freshman class be mean more than numbers hmm. to the university. Uh, there were, I think, 28,000 students here at the time, and people really felt, because we had these students' numbers and had mm -hmm. to use them for everything, as if that was how we were viewed by the school, mm -hmm. um, which wasn't necessarily true, but it was what I thought was of interest. Over the course of the four years, um, there were just the normal issues, including running concerts, mm -hmm. which the Interfraternity Council had won, and I'm talking about Simon and Garfunkel came up, Diana Ross and the Supremes mm -hmm. came up. They were in rec hall, and it was a big money maker uh, because you could fill the hall twice, and I think the tickets were probably four or five dollars, <laughs> and but you could still make a fair amount mm -hmm. of money bringing them, and they weren't that expensive. Um, and so the, uh, that was one of the issues. As time went on, of course, the issues changed on campus, relating more and more to the war. Because by 67, the war was in full swing. And 68, of course, was a major year mm -hmm. uh, in the Vietnam War. And in um, 67, the end of 67, students began leaving college and being drafted or going off to war. Uh, the treasurer of the student government in 67 was a, a young, young boy, Tom Reich, and um, he went off to uh, the military and went off to Vietnam and had died before I graduated, oh gosh. a year later. Mm -hmm. um, so it became an issue on campus. Uh, it was, I like to say, a fairly conservative campus but, and I don't remember which year it was, whether it was in 67 or 68, though the student government passed a resolution condemning the draft, and condemning the draft on the basis that it was discriminatory since us college students didn't have to go mm -hmm. until we graduated. And there were all these exemptions, and it was very clear even back then that if you were wealthy uh, or had money, you didn't go. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I remember when we proposed that, in fact, I think I was certainly one of the people who proposed it. I'm not sure in my memory, but I remember we talked about it and proposed it and then passed the resolution to the student council, uh, student government, USG, that the, it got coverage nationally. The Associated Press um, covered it big because Penn State was not Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And it was not Columbia where they were having demonstrations, and there had not been demonstrations here on campus. 
And so the fact that the Penn State student government was passing a re resolution condemning the draft for discriminating against poor and blacks uh, was quite a issue. And, um, uh, but, you know, there were other issues. The, my senior year, uh, John Fox, who had been vice president of student government, ran against Womer. What was Womer's first name? I don't remember. And he, John Fox's slogan was he wanted to bring an actual lion to campus. So Navy had a goat, and <laughs> it's true, <laughs> absolutely true. And the Texas Longhorns had their steers, and John Fox wanted to bring a lion. Uh, fortunately, we're all chuckling, as, as did the students, and John lost <laughs> <laughs> that election, although he did go on to become a United States congressman mm -hmm. uh, for a number of years. But um, so that was one of the issues. Um, the, the other big issues, of course, began in, I can't pin the year down, might have been 65 or 66, that women, of course, were not allowed to live off campus. Mm -hmm. The policy at the time was in loco parentis, which is that the university replaced our parents while we were here. And for many students whose parents were more forgiving than the university in a very strict uh, uh, quota and a very strict curfew at night. The women had to be in at 11 o'clock and they could, couldn't live off campus. They could not visit boys in apartments off campus without risking being thrown out of school. That was a big issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in fact, there was a vote to get rid of the visiting boys off campus, and I remember this very clearly, the Dean of Women was Dorothy Lip, or Lit. Lip. Lip, Dorothy mm -hmm. Lip. And the vote was like 13 to one. The Vice President for Student Affairs, I wanna say, was a Dr. Bernreuter, and mm -hmm. he said, well, the vote was 13 to one to allow women to visit off campus, but Dean Lip had really good reasons, so we're not going to change the policy, which resulted in some serious demonstrations on campus, mm -hmm. and the policy was tossed over, and Bornreuter found himself out of a job wow. fairly quickly, mm -hmm. as did, I think, Lip. Um, the students were, you know, it was, we, we had, of course, no co-ed dorms. Nobody thought of co-ed dorms mm -hmm. uh, back in those days, but um, uh, people were feeling that they were free and should be considered to be free. Uh, you know, the Vietnam War on campus changed people's attitudes about their responsibilities and responsibility for themselves. As you know, at one point, the national drinking age went to 18 because the slogan is, if we're old enough to die for our country, we're old enough to drink. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that permeated the campus and permeated the minds of students. Certainly, um, it, this was 1968 was, I guess, just the start of the women's liberation movement. It didn't really get into full swing, I want to say, till 69 or 70, although I bet that Kate Millett's book was probably out at that time, or Betty Friedan's book were probably out mm -hmm. uh, in that time. Um, another big issue on campus or discussion was contraception. The birth control pill was new uh, back then. And um, there was discussion about whether it had changed the habits or practices on campus. I kidded you earlier that my first TV appearance was on the Today Show in 1968. They came up to Penn State to interview a bunch of us about sex on campus uh, because the issue was whether or not women being in the birth control had changed that. And um, I, I didn't, what did I know? Do you remember what? Do you remember what what your contribution was to the in your interview? What oh, did, oh, I remember. What did you say? <laughs> well, we st there were like seven or eight of us being mm -hmm. interviewed, all student government mm -hmm. types, and um, and the so that was the question asked, and I was like the fourth or fifth person asked, and the question was so same one as the birth control pill or sex on campus changed as a result of it. And remember, the Today Show starts at 7 in the morning. And mm -hmm. my comment was, I don't know whether it's changed the activity 
but here we are on live national television discussing sex at seven in the morning. <laughs> and that was the lead. Uh, that, was the, that was me starting the Today Show. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, uh, it was funny, because what did any of us really know about the habits of others? Well, how would you describe yourself uh, ideologically in terms of values, maybe social issues? You, you kind of go back in time, mid-60s. What, 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 how would you describe, have described your viewpoints? Oh, I was a liberal. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say I was a radical. We did have a Students for Democratic Society, SDS, chapter mm -hmm. on campus. And interestingly, the SDS chapters came to the student government meeting where we voted on whether to condemn the draft, which was interesting because they came to us and most other campuses, the student mm -hmm. government had become unimportant and it was the SDS and other organizations that were in charge. Um, I was uh, clearly in favor at that time of women being able to <laughs> visit men in dorms, mm -hmm. uh, I mean in, in apartments or go to fraternity houses which they could only do when the house mother was in. Mm -hmm. There were limited hours. Um, politically, uh, I came up here to campus in 64 and uh, went to work on Lyndon Johnson's campaign. Uh, the Democratic Party bust a couple of us down to Belfont to a mm -hmm. phone bank to make phone calls for Johnson in 64. Mm -hmm. um, by the, when I was a senior, um, I was already working on campus for Robert Kennedy uh, when he was shot and killed. Um, and that was the very end of our senior year. Mm -hmm. um, and and that almost causes me to recall that my graduation was probably the 10th of January <laughs> since mm -hmm. he was sh shot, I recall, on the 4th or 6th of January. Of, of, uh, I said January, excuse me, June. June. Of June. Mm -hmm. And um, so in, in April of that year, uh, Martin Luther King was killed. And this was a very white place. You know, the cafeteria workers were white. There were cleaning ladies for the dorms who came in, and they were all white. There were no Latinos here. There were no, virtually no blacks living in the middle of the state at that time. And so uh, of interest, though, Martin Luther King had come up to speak here in 1965 or 67. I don't remember which year, but I went. 65. 65. Yeah and uh, went to Rec Hall to hear him speak, mm -hmm. um, which was fascinating uh, because I had heard him speak in Hempstead, New York. My parents had taken me mm. to hear him in 1963 and at a church. And in 1963, he was at that church, um, the Reverend Martin Luther King. And in 1965, when he, he was here, he was a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Martin wow. Luther King. And the difference in the speeches mm -hmm. is, of course, palpable, but he was speaking to a largely black audience in Hempstead and mm -hmm. speaking to a almost entirely white audience mm -hmm. here at State College. So personally, um, you know, I was what I am today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Haven't changed, still a uh, liberal. Uh, person, believer in human rights. I was involved, was a member of the National Organization for Women mm -hmm. back in the early 70s and gave them free legal services. Um, so that's always kind of been. How would you have described the, the student body the, in the aggregate in, in the midst when you were there, Dan? Well, I would, I'll tell you a funny story which I think sort of describes it. It was fairly conservative. Uh, my thought was that it was fairly conservative. Of course, conservative in those days mostly was evidenced by inactivity. Students weren't involved in student government or weren't all that involved in the issue. And so they weren't, you know, when I ran for freshman class president, what, a total of, you know, less than t about 20% of the students voted, mm -hmm. okay, which would be you know, not unusual, I suppose. And so I thought it was conservative, um, particularly with all of the mid-Pennsylvania people who lived here. Pennsylvania hasn't changed. You know, they talk about there's two Pennsylvanians, Pittsburgh and Philly, and then 
a different state in between, and it mm -hmm. was true then, and there were lots of students here who were that in between. But I've never forgotten that at the end of my senior year, uh, Champ Storch, who was, I think he was Dean of Students, and he might have been, uh, I don't recall his exact title. He went on to become um, Dean at, at Slippery Rock University, left Penn State, invited me to his office to talk about what I saw coming in the next year. I was leaving the end of 68. We had had uh, around the country, of course, the riots following Martin Luther King's mm -hmm. death, um, the events of Robert Kennedy's death. And he asked, and, and what was going on in these other campuses, Berkeley, other places, and he wondered whether or not that would happen at Penn State. And my reaction was that if the students at Penn State tried to close down the campus, that many of the students would step over their bodies and still go to class. They mm -hmm. weren't going to be deterred by that. Uh, I was totally wrong <laughs> because sometime in 1969, there were student demonstrations up here against the war, and they closed down the campus, and nobody stepped over anybody's bodies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I suppose it could be that I misjudged the nature of the student who opposed the war. Uh, maybe I just miscalculated that they didn't care that much about going to class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if somebody else wanted to close down the campus, they could. Mm -hmm. But I thought that the campus was sufficiently c conservative, it would not happen here. Um, and I went off to GW Law School in Washington, D.C., where um, of course, all the demonstrations were occurring against the war. And in fact, after, um, once I got to Washington, D.C., I participated in every anti-war demonstration through the end of the war in 1972. Mm -hmm. So Washington was a very different place, of course. Uh, when I got to Washington in August of 68, the city still smelled of the fires hmm. from the rioting in, in April. 68. Um, so it was a very different place. Mm -hmm. But um, um, the campus, as the rest of the country, the young people rose up against what was going on mm -hmm. uh, and the war. And so, you know, they say that the Vietnam War was a defining for our generation, kind of a defining event. And I think it it was in some ways here on campus mm -hmm. as well, although a little bit more after I left. You mentioned earlier that, that Penn State was very white. I think that was your expression. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk more about that um, in your time there and, and, and how this manifested in your life and maybe in the uni university at large. Sure. Well, um, and my numbers could be wrong, but my the freshman class was 4,000 students or whatever it was. Um, might have been more than that. I think we graduated 4,000, so I mm -hmm. suppose it was somewhat more than that. And as I recall, there were less than 400 African Americans on campus. Many of them were students who were here because of athletic scholarships. So the only dominant area of seeing African Americans was here in North Halls, where they housed the athletes. The football team was mm -hmm. up in North Halls, and the other teams were up here in North Halls. Uh, when I ran for freshman cl class president, the chairman of one of the political parties, the one that I ran on, uh, was African-American. His name was Marvin Peebles. He was from Philadelphia. And so he began to spend a um, lot of time in my dorm. I was in Pollock A at the time as a freshman. And Marvin came to my room with some other people working on the campaign, and we would talk about it, whatever, and um, learned not long into the campaign that I was uh, known as the N-loving kike, because I was Jewish. Um, and so uh, it's actually what caused me that January to, after I'd lost the election, to go join a fraternity, because I wasn't going to live in the dorms anymore. And it wasn't just one person. Um, it was a number of people. There were enough Jewish people on campus that we had five or seven of the fraternities, of the 57 fraternities. but. Um, it was hostile and apparently made more so by the fact that Marvin was my friend and was black um, and was there. I was bringing him into the dorm all the time. So it was very white. Um, 
I don't know that I've, over the years, ran into many African Americans in my class or became friends with other African Americans other than Marvin. He was two years ahead and left at the end of my sophomore year. Uh, he graduated. And um, I'm trying to remember whether I had other African American friends at the time. The issues were, um, of course, back then, when I was a freshman, uh, there were discussions amongst a very small group about, and not me, um, never really crossed my mind about going down to Mississippi for the voter registration mm -hmm. efforts, which were going on. Um, I think, I don't know that anybody went from Penn State and participated in those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, well, there were two campaigns that okay. I, I think are of note leading up to that. One is that uh, Lenny Berkowitz ran for president of the student government as a third party candidate running on the apathy ticket where he promised to do nothing. That, and this was maybe in 67, could have mm -hmm. been in 66, mm -hmm. but he ran on the apathy ticket promising to do nothing and he got a respectable number of votes. He did quite well. Now mm -hmm. the truth was, knowing Lenny, he actually wanted to be president of the state <laughs> government, but um, he, he ran on this campaign thinking it might help. The other thing was, when I was a sophomore and leading the political party that I was, that still existed at the time, there was the university party, the campus party, and the liberal party. The liberal party would eventually fold it into the university party. But I ran a, a young woman, Patricia Bach, who, for freshman class president. Mm -hmm. And no woman had ever run for that office or any office at that point. Mm -hmm. for a freshman class or the other class presidency, mm -hmm. which is another indication of what the campus was like. Um, the other issue is to 1968, well, it was 67 going into 68 for the presidency. Uh, Jeff Long, who was a member of the Acacia fraternity, ran against Bob Kleeblatt, who was Phi Sig, I think Phi Sigma Delta, one of the Jewish fraternities. And Bobby had... Um, run the student government, uh, run the Model United Nations. And Jeff Long had been head of the Liberal Arts Student Council, and they ran against each other for president of student government. And when Jeff Long won, the next morning on campus, there were swastikas painted with the statement, we beat the Jew, on sidewalks uh, around the campus. I, we always presumed, and nobody was ever prosecuted or pressed mm -hmm. on it, but presumed it was by his fraternity brothers, and um, uh, which was known as a not terribly welcoming mm -hmm. fraternity for diversity issues. Um, so those were the. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk a, a bit about uh, the administration, uh, the Walker administration? You you, you referenced the um, the controversy dealing with the vote about in local parentis. Um, and you've, you've had great experience with student, student government. What was your sense of, of the administration's approach and ways of dealing with student government during your time? How would you describe that? Well, I, I think it was individual in that Dr. Bernwarder was very standoffish. Um, nobody particularly knew Eric Walker mm -hmm. that I recall. He came to our fraternity one time to give us an award because we had the improved academic, highest improved academics from one semester to another. And that was clearly related to the fact that the Selective Service uh, had just put in academic requirements so that if you were at the top of your class, you could stay in college, and if you mm -hmm. were at the bottom of your class, you couldn't. And so our fraternity had a fair number of pretty bright guys who decided mm -hmm. it was time to study. And so Eric Walker came to the house for that. But he was not a figure that we saw a whole lot on campus. Um, he lived right here, of course, in what's now the Alumni mm -hmm. Center in that house, but, uh, and I know that changed down the road. Uh, Dr. Bernreuter, as I recall, was very standoffish. Um, Dr. Lip was very difficult in terms of these were her girls and she was protecting them from all these terrible boys. <laughs> who they needed protection from um, looking after themselves, I guess, didn't cross mm -hmm. her mind. 
Um, on the other hand, there were people like Champ Storch who came to student events, made sure to get to know students and mm -hmm. have personal relationships with them. And that again might just be my own personal experiences, but that's all I can mm -hmm. talk about. Why don't we shift to academics? Um, you, you were a political science major at, at, at Penn State. Um, what was your academic life at Penn State? What were your courses like? Um, what was perhaps your most favorite course, favorite professor? Well, I must start this by candidly saying that I majored in student activities far more than political science. Uh, I really did. Mm -hmm. um, I went to class. I was not a hard studier. Um, uh, I didn't bother to do that till I got to law school. And in those days, of course, you could slip by with the gentleman's C, as it was discussed. There has been, I clearly know, but through today, grade inflation. So the grades mm -hmm. are higher and the bell curve is higher than it was in those days. Um, the academics is a political science major. I guess the, what I really fell in love with, though, was history. And so I took a lot of history cases. Courses, I guess today people would say I minored in history mm -hmm. because American history, international history was fascinating to me and I had some good professors, although I don't remember mm -hmm. um, the names. In political science, as a major, I wound up taking courses from uh, Ruth Silver, S-I-L-V-A. She was one of the few female professors at the time. She was quite distinguished and quite well known. She was one of the authors of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, which gets talked mm -hmm. about nowadays because it relates to what happens if a president is incompetent mm -hmm. and can be replaced or how you replace them and also the issue of um, replacing a vice president, or, mm -hmm. you know, which all started with um, uh, you know, assassinations and then how mm -hmm. did you replace the vice president from there. Um, so the I'm, I'm not the best person at all to discuss whether it was a difficult place academically mm -hmm. since I didn't put myself forward with great effort most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I did amazingly get into George Washington Law School with a 2.69 average, um, which you can't apply to GW Law School mm -hmm. today with anything less than a 3.5. Um, I got into Georgetown mm -hmm. as well. And Dr. Silver, Professor Silver, uh, actually pointed me towards uh, George Washington. I knew her mm. well enough, I went in and talked to her about it. And George Washington had a younger, more activist faculty mm -hmm. and had started different types of courses in law school um, than they had at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So she steered me towards George Washington rather than Georgetown. Uh, so she did have an influence, mm -hmm. serious influence on my life. Um, but I, I remember one professor uh, took a humanities course and um, I can picture him. I cannot remember his name. Um, he would be fired in a heartbeat today since he dated female students mm -hmm. <laughs> or would go out drinking with female students. And we all knew it. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a good professor. But today, as you mm -hmm. know, the standards have changed entirely uh, with an interesting class. Your favorite memories from Penn State? You can, you can stretch as far, as wide as you want. You can do your years or your, your post, uh, gra you know, after your right. graduation. What would you put as your favorite memories of Penn State? Well, I did, I loved going to the football games. Uh, when I got up here to campus, somebody told me to join the Block S. We held up cards. Oh, the, the, yes, yeah. wow. and you flipped them over, and you had mm -hmm. red ones and blue ones mm -hmm. and white ones, and 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 that meant you got good seats. You didn't sit in the end zone. Wow! So people would charge down to the hub to sign up for the block S, so that you could have the good seats, which I did. Was that a season-long commitment? Yes. Oh. Yes. So you got the good good seats for the good whole season. Good seats for the whole season, and mm -hmm. you had to go, and that was fun. Um, gymnastics at Penn State was the thing. I mean, as much as football was, gymnastics, w the Russian national team came to Penn State hmm. in 1968 to compete against the Penn State gymnastics team. We had a couple of Olympians 
uh, from that area, st era. Steve Cohn, uh, who is from Philly, was an uh, Olympian gymnast, and then Bob Embry, mm -hmm. who's now an orthopedic surgeon, mm -hmm. um, was, was an Olympian. So going to the gym meets was a great deal of fun. Mm -hmm. um, simply being on campus, truthfully, when you, the fall up here, when the leaves change, and it was just such a beautiful place to mm -hmm. spend time. Um, and I was a runner back then, which was unusual. I'd run in high school, but continued to run. I wasn't on the track team. I was not mm -hmm. very good. I was on the ha track team in high school and wasn't very good, but came up here and I used to run on the campus regularly for exercise, which was before the running era took over where tons and of people And you've seen how much, uh, how much state college has changed. Oh, enormously, mm -hmm. you know, enormously. But on the, on the other hand, the core of it is still the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we come up here, we came up yesterday and Thursday, and we parked at the Nittany Lion Inn parking deck, and we will not move our car until we leave on Sunday. Wow. We, will, we walked into town last night for dinner. We will wow. walk to the football game tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. um, we walk everywhere. And, um, and yeah, there were a lot more buildings, and certainly you walk down College Avenue downtown, there were not anywhere near those restaurants mm -hmm. uh, that there are today. There was no fine dining anywhere in State College or the area. Um, but, but my fondest memories um, were probably the other issue I would say, because I belonged to a fraternity and I had, but I was not involved in the house very much. I had a couple of friends in the fraternity, but I was a campus guy. Mm -hmm. And it was the people from the student government who probably, I remember fondly, we had a week-long or a four-day-long national training laboratories mm -hmm. event for student government people where they came up and we learned about group dynamics and we, the, the first time, I remember it was 1967, mm -hmm. where you'd lean back and fall into people's arms and trust them. I mean, that became wow. kind of a bigger thing in the country mm -hmm. and did that. So it was the other, my real friends were the other student government people, been Bill Sinclair, who headed the Men's Residence Council, and Faith mm -hmm. Tanny, who was the Women's Residence Council, and um, Ed Dench, who was the town independent man. I think he's a doctor hmm. and still in State College. Oh. Um, those, those were where my friendships were, because I spent so much time in the student government office mm -hmm. and, and uh, remember those. So if, we, if we, you have the benefit now of, of, of 50 years looking back, what, what would you say would be the, the defining descriptors of your generation at Penn State? H hard question, but, but if you're gonna have a couple, couple of descriptors for your generation now that you've had 50 years to, to process it, um, what would those be? Fun-loving? Alcohol-using? At the end, pot smoking, mm -hmm. although that really came more 68, 69 than 68. In my fraternity in 68, I knew there were guys smoking pot. Mm -hmm. When I came back to campus in 69, people were smoking at the dining room table. <laughs> and so um, it was the description that George Paterno said to me that it was Happy Valley mm -hmm. was accurate. It was absolutely mm -hmm. accurate. Any bad events got buried. There was a um, senior year, there was a, a guy who, domestic matter, he shot his, into his girl's dorm from College Avenue. She was in South Halls. Mm -hmm. It was the first shooting they'd had around here. I think the next year there was a murder off campus, it was related to drugs. It was the mm -hmm. first murder in State College since 1948. Mm -hmm. So it was just a place you came and hung out and enjoyed. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that was true for many of the students. There were clearly students who worked a lot harder than I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if you had, to, how would you compare the students of today with the students? Uh, you've been to campus a number of times to watch games and, and so I've been, forth. I've been to campus, haven't been up for a game in a few years, but uh -huh. we've, been, we've been to campus, come back to campus. Uh -huh. 
Um, More similar or dissimilar the students that, well, you, that you observe now? It's still a pretty white place, mm -hmm. is my observation. The diversity seems more in noticing Asians and noticing uh, Latinos. Of course, there are African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we, I've seen more African Americans than I saw in those days. Of course, the campus is now 48,000 instead of 28,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a much bigger place. Um, the um, but my experience is, has been odd that the students I've really gotten to talk to have been at political science events. They have, in the summer in Washington, D.C., they have the political science department has the interns who are spending their internship mm -hmm. in Washington meet with some alumni to learn what the alumni's, alumni did with their careers and what we have done in our lives. And all of those students, I mean, I'll go to a dinner and these dinners and there'll be 20 students there and they're all paternal scholars. They all speak two languages. Yeah. They all have 3.95 averages. You know, at, at that dinner, I can assure you, at any one of those dinners, there's more students with 3.9 averages than existed on the campus, mm -hmm. at least that I knew mm -hmm. when I went. Yeah. It's a much finer academic institution. It's known internationally as mm -hmm. this fine academic institution, which it was not. We mm -hmm. always got the Playboy Party mm -hmm. School number one or two ranking. And I know that continued, because I remember Graham Spanier one time saying when we got it, when he was president, that this isn't fair, we just have more students. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be more votes for <laughs> Penn State than, than otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably a fair comment. I, there's lots of party schools around that, that are known as party schools today and, and uh, whatever. But we were known as a mm -hmm. party school back in those days as well. Thanks very much, Dan. Sure. I really enjoyed talking. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for sharing your thoughts.